you're thinking, John, you didn't say Shabbat Shalom yet. Right? That's what it is. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, so now we'll try again from the beginning. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed for all eternity. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach. Lolam There we go. <laughs> That's a little bit. And join me with the Vishamru. You remember the Vishamru? Okay, that should be page 14. And we'll do the uh, upbeat version. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat. As soon as I put it up on the board, the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And this shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Vushamru v'nei Yisrael et ha-Shabbat la'asot et ha-Shabbat l'adorotam v'arit olam Vushamru v'nei Yisrael Shabbat Shabbat so did a Shabbat, the Dorota Berito La. Kisheshet Yamim, a Sahadonai, a Sahadonai, et a Shmaim Vetarez. A Vusham Ru, Vene Israel, et a Shabbat, the so. Et ha Shabbat le Dorota Berit Olam. Uvayom Hashvi, Uvayom Hashvi, Shabbat Vayina Fa, Shabbat Vayina Fa, Shvushamru, Vene Israel, Et ha Shabbat, La Sot, Et ha Shabbat le Dorota Berit Olam. Vushamru ve Yisrael et ha-Shabbat Lasot et ha-Shabbat Ledorot ha-Merit Olam Amen. That's one of those prophecies, that's one of those prophecies that has not been fulfilled yet. <laughs> Is that right? I don't remember all of the nations going to Israel and <laughs> worshiping on Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat yet. But it will happen. It will happen. Okay. If you want to follow the next one, it'll be on page 8. But really, Brandon's the only guy here today who's going to have to help me. I know you don't know how to can it's okay. Just at least help me with the English, all right? It's Eshet uh, Chayil. It should be in page, on page 8. To bless the women. You there? Okay. All right. With English first, a woman of valor, who can find? She is worth far more than precious jewels. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her, and he profits greatly thereby. Amen. <laughs> Mimsa, 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 Vurahok, Mipninim, Vurahok, Mipninim, 
Vrachok mi pnini mi kra Vatachta le pala le pala le pala Vushalal 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 kulo I'm glad I get to do that every week to bless you guys. I don't know if you get it anywhere else, so make sure to take care. All right, Diana, announcements? There, if anybody is interested in learning Hebrew, and if there's enough interest, there'll be a new beginner's class starting on Sunday from 4 to 5 on July 8th. The cost is $15, and you will need the book, All of the Book 1. Okay. $15 yeah. per week. Huh? <laughs> $15 per week each yeah. time, yeah. yeah. And it's it's a definite now. Oh, it is? Yep, it's going to happen. Oh. Both, of those, both of those classes. Okay. So, and you can get the book on Amazon. Also, if anybody is interested in reaching um, Jewish people, um, again, if there's enough interest, oh, you said there already is, so again, it'll be Tuesday nights, strictly from 6.30 to 7.30, starting July 10th, and the class should last from 7 to 12 weeks, and there are sign-ups for both over there, if anybody's interested. And those are both at, at the house, they're not here. So we need to sign up, you know, there are people like a Facebook that are interested in stuff already. So if you're wanting to do it, you know, don't put it off signing on there. Or at least email me if you didn't want to do it like now or something. Uh, let me know soon. So we make sure there's enough, you know, seats available and everything, okay? Okay. We're also looking for volunteers um, for children's ministry. Um, we're thinking of doing like a rotation, so, you know, maybe one... Um, week a month. If you're interested, we will have materials. John ordered the materials. It's probably already here. Um, so um, when we have children, that way um, they can be taught at their level also. Uh, and all these books over here are free. If anybody would like any of those books, please feel free to take them, but do not add any to what's already there. also like to pray for Lois because she fell recently. Mm -hmm. um, she's doing okay, but um, you know, just keep her in your prayers and I'll say also for um, Jose and Tiffany. Um, I'm sure most of you that know them know they recently lost a nephew who's only a few months old. So that's why I guess they were kind of here. Having a little trouble up here today, but that's okay. Do you mind coming up and maybe help? See if you can slide that back on together. Um, Lord, Dennis, would you mind leading the prayer for?
that she she's just a walking miracle as it is for us so much. So we just um, trust that you will continue to care for her and just um, touch her with your hand of healing, and she'll be joining us again as she's um, been able to in the past. And we just put those in your hands, Lord. We um, pray for Jason as he's in his new place in Arizona that you would just continue to open doors for him um, in reaching the lost um, that he can find in the Messianic Church, Lord, and that you would just provide for all his needs. Lord, I lift up Virginia to you, that you would just um, continue to make her stronger and that she will be able to relocate here. And Father, for all the lost here in Jacksonville, that you would just pour out your real hadash and just bring these people, Lord, um, here or wherever um, they can have an encounter with you and the Messiah and that you would just be able to transform their lives, Lord. So we just um, come before you, Lord, and, and just ask that you would bless what John's going to be teaching us today, Lord, and just help us to continue to be these empty vessels um, being used for your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Amen. Amen. Lord, please fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Will it, can we set it in here, will it stay up if we, if we close it? If we try to close it, will it just stay in there until we're done? Then we can mess with it after. Yeah. Okay, um, and I think we're going to draft you again. Cause you, <laughs> okay. uh, so let's get ready, we'll rise. Uh, you can look in your Siddur on page 64 as we prepare to take the Torah from the Ark with the Ein Kamocha. But she's going to draft you. What? My wife is going to draft you for this. Why am I being drafted? To carry the Torah. And page 64, English first. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, and there is nothing like your works. You can join me. <laughs> your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion is throughout all generations. The Lord reigns. The Lord has reigned. The Lord will reign forever and ever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. In Kamocha, Elohim, Adonai, Vain Kamasecha, Malchutha, Malchutko, Olamim, Umem Shautacha, Bechotor Vador, Adonai, Melech, Adonai, Malach, Adonai, Mloch. Lo lam ha'ed, Adonai oz lo amo yitain, Adonai avareich et amo v'ashalom. And at the bottom, for the Torah parade, uh, the Vayahi, and we have a couple customs here. One, of course, is very traditional. You take your siddur or your tzitzit or your Bible when it passes by, and you touch it to the breastplate and then you can kiss it because God's word is sweet to our lips and it's healing to our bones. So if you need healing or you know someone that needs healing, grab a hold of that in faith when you do that. The other tradition we have here, it's a little more peculiar to us uh, and some others. When you hear the word Vyafutsu, right? It's, uh, it's a word talking about being scattered. And it's almost more like shattered. Uh, at a Jewish wedding, you know, we, sh we stomp on the glass and it shatters. It goes everywhere. Well, that's kind of what's being talked about here. God has enemies and when he arises, may his enemies be scattered. Like that glass is scattered, right? Shattered and spread all over the place and fleeing, okay? So, those are, so we, we stomp. When we hear of a Yafutsu, we stomp. English first. 
when the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. Vahibin so haron, vayomer Moshe, kuma Adonai, vayafutsu oivecha, vayanusu masanecha mipanecha. Ki mitzion tetze Torah, ki mitzion tetze Torah, Udvar Adonai Mirushalayim Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Ramo Israel Iktu Shato Tamod zakiye bar Adonaya la Torah. Tamod Miriam bat Mardchai la Hatara. Tamod vora bat Azriel la Brida Chadasha. Join me on page 66. Uh, you, you can be seated. If you want, what we want to rise for is the actual reading of Scripture. And then, okay? So the reader will be up here. They hopefully will remember to tell you. And uh, bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. You can join me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bachar banu mikol haamim v'natan lanu et torato Baruch atah Adonai noten haTorah The reading today is taken from Leviticus chapter 10 verses 19 and 20. And you'll want to rise now. Sorry, I need the microphone. Sorry. Is it on? There we go. Vida Ber Aharon El Moshe Hain Hayom Rivu Et Hatatam Va'et olatam lifne Adonai vatik ra ne oti ka'ele va'achal ti chatat hayom hayitav va'ene Adonai. Vayishma Moshe Vayitav Vayinav. Aharon answered Moshe, Even though they offered their sin offering and burnt offering today, things like these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have pleased Adonai? On hearing this, Moshe was satisfied. You may be seated. We all know the context for that, right? No? They had just uh, sanctified the Mishkan for the first time and made the first sacrifices. Moshe made the first ones, then Aharon and his sons made the next ones, and God sent fire down, right? Devoured the whole burnt offering. 
right, in front of all the people, they all fell down and they're worshiping. Everything's going great, right? Everything's perfect. But then two of Aharon's four sons take it on themselves to go up and try to offer something else, something different that God didn't command. And what happened to them? They were devoured by fire. And so there were certain things that were supposed to be eaten from those sacrifices, and Aharon and his sons, I mean, they, they weren't allowed to go out and mourn. They had to stay in and complete their service. Um, but they were certainly not in a good mood. They weren't exactly hungry or anything. So that's the context for this verse. Join me with the closing blessing. Bottom of page 66, English first. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah temet, v'chaye ulam natah batocheinu, baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah, amen. And uh, please rise for the vizot. It's page 68, you can join me. custom here for the guys, but I'm the only guy, is with the index finger, but with the women is to put your pinky at the text itself. We'll do the English first. No, no, we'll do the Hebrew first. V'zot ha-Torah asher sa-Moshe lifnei b'nei Yisrael al pi Adonai v'yamoshe Behold the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at God's command by Moses' hand. Amen. You can join me on page 70 while they're addressing the Torah for the Haftorah blessing. To the English first. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected good prophets and was pleased with their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chooses the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and prophets of truth and righteousness. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher bachar Min vitim tovim Vratza vedivrehem Hanemarim Be'emet Baruch atah Adonai Habocher batorah U Moshe Abdo, U Yisrael Lamo, U Vin Vie Haemet, Vatsede. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to read Psalm 39 7. I'm going to read third, uh, Psalm 39 7. Ah. Betzele Chen Yid Halech Ish Ach Hebel or Hevel Yehemayon Yid Spor Veloyad Mi Os Pham And in English, humans go about like shadows, their turmoil is all for nothing. They accumulate wealth. Oops. They accumulate wealth not knowing who will enjoy its benefits. Yeah, um, we 
we get caught up in so many things in life, right? Pursuit of money or uh, all sorts of things. And you can sit down. And we lose track sometimes. You know, no one from the first century or even or before lives forever in this life. It's time for all of us. If uh, Messiah doesn't come back in the next hundred years, no one in this room will be here. No one here will be alive. So, something we have to deal with sooner or later. You know? Join me with the closing blessing, bottom of page 70, English first. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all eternities, faithful in all generations, the trustworthy God who says and does, who speaks and makes it come to pass, all of whose words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for not one word of yours is turned back unfulfilled, for you are a faithful and compassionate God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God who is faithful in all his words. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Tzur kol haolamim tzadik b'chol hadorot Ha'el ha'neman ha'omer oseh Ha'daverum kayein shekol devarai v'met v'tzedek Neman atahu Adonai Eloheinu v'neemanim devarecha Join me with the blessing for the Brit Chadashah, ah, page 72. I'm sorry, get ready to join Devorah, <laughs> the blessing for the read on page 72. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Manu, Vashir Yeshua, Vahadibrot Shel Habrit HaChadasha. Baruch Atah Adonai, Notein Habrit HaChadasha. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the commandments of the New Covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the New Covenant. And if you can stand. I'm reading from Hebrews 5 6. Kamo she amar gam the makom aher atah kohen le olam al vibrati makisidek. Kafos kai en etero lege su erehus eis tan iona katate taksim. And I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible and the New King James Bible. Also, as he says in another place, you are a Kohen forever to be compared with Melchizedek. And the New King James says, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You can be seated. The author of Hebrews used Psalm 110.4 when he was speaking about Yeshua's priesthood. Psalm 110.4 states, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. These verses show the eternal nature of Yeshua's priesthood. This is proven even more in 1 Timothy 2.5, which states, For God is one. And there is but one mediator between God and humanity, Yeshua the Messiah, himself human. Because Yeshua is the priest forever, he will be the, he is the mediator between God and us forever. Even though Yeshua's priesthood is not traced back to the line of Aaron or human descent, Yeshua can still be called a priest because his priesthood is by divine declaration. Melchizedek, who is mentioned in Genesis 14, 18 through 20, 
was a priest of El Elyon, the Most High God. Just as, just as Melchizedek was a prototype of Yeshua the Messiah, Yeshua, uh, Yeshua is the true and final priest forever. Baru Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natamanu Hadivar HaAmet Vahaye Olam Nata Betochenu Baru Ata Adonai Notein Habri HaHadasha Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Okay. Please rise and join me with Eitz Chaim, page 74, as we return the Torah to the Ark. Eitz Chaim, he, Ramach HaSikimah, take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Koha kavod to our team. Well done. Well, I thought so. <laughs> all right. So we are in the book of Hebrews. All right. We've seen a lot in the first five verses of Hebrews. We learned some Hebrew idioms, right? Um, we've learned some historical and cultural context. Uh, we've read this within the literary context of the Tanakh and found a theology that matches all the way around. And we're also seeing the point, right? Uh, we see the author emphasizing the greatness of this new message and of the new messenger. He's not just a prophet, though prophets are great. He's greater than all the prophets. He's not just an angel, although angels are great. He's greater than all of the angels. He's the son of the living God. All right, that's where we're at. Are you ready for some more? <laughs> so teased. Here we go. This is where we're headed. There's a reason why he's saying these things. All right, so let's start with verse 6, uh, Hebrew 1 6, and again. When God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. All right? Now, um, it's an interesting claim because there are other claims about the firstborn. Many say the firstborn is Israel. Have you heard that? Are they right? Is this author right or are both ideas right? What do you think? We got a both. We got, I don't know, because we're still talking. No, we have to study that. 
Yeah, study, okay. All right. Um, well, uh, let's say first of all, where in the scripture does it make any does it make any sense to you even, or where in the scripture if it does make sense somehow to you, where does God command the angels to worship Israel? Any hands? <laughs> any hands? Nope. I mean, there there are scriptures where Israel is talked about as God's firstborn. There are. But nowhere does God command his angels to worship Israel. You follow? Look at Exodus 4.22. For Israel as the firstborn. Can someone read that? Maybe Kathy? Nice and loud. Exodus Shemot 4.22. In case you haven't, if, if it's not familiar to you, Israel is the firstborn, then this is the verse for you, Exodus 4.22. Then you are to tell Pharaoh, Adonai says, Israel is my firstborn son. Pretty plain, right? Mm. What about angels or mankind as the firstborn? We explored that a little the other week, right? Um, so check that older recording if you're curious. But here's a new one. Look at Jeremiah, Yirmayahu, Jeremiah 31.9. Do you have it? No? Whoever, raise your hand when you find it. Yirmayahu 31.9. Someone read, read it real loud for me. Thirty-one nine. Thirty-one nine. Oh, it's a different numbering system. <laughs> it's one of those. So, what is that? Now, I'm a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. I thought Israel was the firstborn son. Now Ephraim, specifically, is the firstborn son. Hmm. How about Psalm eighty-nine twenty-seven? Psalm eighty-nine twenty-seven, and maybe well, well. Some of you are looking that up. Someone could also look up Colossians 1.15. Psalm 89, 27. And Colossians 1.15. And they would have the psalm. Yeah, but and who's that talking about? That's a messianic psalm. The Messiah would be the firstborn. Colossians 1.15? Yeah. Again, talking about Messiah as the firstborn. Now that it has come to pass. Psalm is looking forward, right? Um, because he hadn't been here yet, but he has been in existence as firstborn. The Messiah is the firstborn. So Israel is the firstborn. Ephraim is the firstborn. <laughs> right? And the Messiah is the firstborn. How can this be? In Judaism, being firstborn means added responsibility. Jacob is called the first, uh, first son. But is he? Is Jacob firstborn? Is he first son? No. Who's first who's who's the firstborn then? Esau. 
Esau was the eldest. Why is Jacob called firstborn then? He bought his birthright. Yeah, that's exactly right. Rabbi Natan said, The Holy One, blessed be he, told Moses, Just as I have made Jacob a firstborn, for it says, Israel my son, my firstborn, so I will make King Messiah a firstborn. As it says, I will appoint him firstborn. I'm throwing that at you. It's not from Scripture because pe some people who are Jewish will say Messiah is the, not firstborn. It's Israel is the firstborn. Well, here is Midrash Rabbah on Exodus 19.7 <laughs> where Rabbi Natan says very specifically, God, he's saying, God says, just as I made Jacob or Israel my firstborn, so King Messiah will be firstborn. That's important. We're trying, you know, you're trying to reach Jewish people. You're talking to them. You want to share truth. Well, if that, there's no escape there. Do you see? There's no escape there. It's in rabbinic writing. All right. Uh, let me also explain this. Sometimes uh, Messiah is talked about as Israel, as being Israel. You ever hear something like that? Like he is Israel, the true Israel or something, right? It's not... <laughs> when the idea is from Scripture is not talking about him replacing Israel, he's representing Israel. When I was in the Navy, all right, and we had a ceremony, and the higher ups arrived. You, you know, we have a Navy's a little peculiar. We have a bell, like on the ship, you ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Commanding officer, naval, air. We don't even say commanding officer, we say naval air station Atlanta arriving. Ding, ding. Ding, ding. And, and a guy walks down. The naval air station didn't get up. How weird would that be, right? With all its hangars and stuff and concrete ramps and... <laughs> come into the hangar? No. The commanding officer of NAS Atlanta was called NAS Atlanta. And he arrived. Um, if you are the leader of an institution or a company or a nation... Uh, you, in one, in a sense, are that institution. What you, if you're the king, what you say goes. What you say, that country says. Does that make sense? You represent them. And who is Yeshua? Who is the Messiah? He is the king of Israel. Do you see? He, in a sense, is Israel. He represents Israel. Not replacing Israel. You, you with me? Good. Moving on. Now, what about the second half of verse 6? It's very controversial in some circles these days. The idea is growing again in our time that the Messiah is not divine. I mean, we covered that a lot already. But let's see what, what does this text say. By the way, we've covered this several times this year, too. And you're welcome to check out those videos. But we'll stick now to this verse. It, it clearly states that Yah commands his angels to worship the Son. Is this the same Yah, the same, the same God, who says in Isaiah 42, 8, I do not share my glory. That's Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah 42, 8. He says, I do not share my glory. And now, <laughs> something odd is happening. He's commanding his angels to worship the Messiah. Are men to be worshipped? What about angels? Are angels to be worshipped? Yeah, that's right. No. A resounding no. Okay, now that we understand that, we can explore this quote. It's from Psalm 97.7. This verse is quoting 97.7. All who worship images will be put to shame. Those who make their boasts and worthless idols bow down to him, all you gods. 
bow down to him all you got. Now that's a little strange. Who is to bow down to the son in this verse? Okay? In the Hebrew text, and, and we're looking at the Masoretic text. It was, you know, the pointer system was added like 500 to 1000 AD. You know, there's an older text out there, but it's not Hebrew. Of the Hebrew section, of the Tanakh. It's called the Septuagint. It's in Greek. And in the Greek there, it says, Pantes we angeloi autu. Dvora, or branded. Uh, so what is that? Pantes hoi angeloi autu. Is that, is it the same as kol Elohim? Kol Elohim is Hebrew. That's where some translations tell you all gods worship him. Do you, do you remember? Is your Greek that rusty? No, I, I know what it's Pantes hoi angeloi autu. All his angels. That's an older text from 300 BC, the Septuagint. All right, and it was a translation of earlier Hebrew texts that we now have available. You follow? All right. So, don't let that trouble you. Then, call Elohim in this particular instance, because we have a witness there that translated this as all his angels worship him or to worship him all right but again who is who is supposed to receive worship men no angels no he there she shares his glory with no one who shares his glory with no one Elohim is hello and Elohim is a plural form a uniplural form it's a plural form, but it becomes a uniplural form with the God of Israel because of the verbs used in pronouns and nouns used with it in context. It makes it very clear. And if you take my Hebrew class, then you'll learn all that, which you can sign up for in the corner today. All right? All right. We see in other scriptures that it, it is David or a special descendant of David who will be king over all the earth in the end. Yet in context, who are they to bow down to? Adonai is king. Psalm 97.1. Okay? In other words, this quote, 97.7, it has a context. Who is it in that context that they're bowing down to? It doesn't mention it being the son. It mentions it, the person that they're bowing down to, in verse 1 is Adonai, yud heh vav -he. It's uh, Hashem that they're being told to bow down to. Do you see how highly the author here regards Yeshua? He's identifying him with Hashem. He's saying that Yeshua is the Davidic king here and that he is Hashem. Because that's what the psalm he's quoting says. Follow all right. Finally, let's not miss the obvious here. If the angels are to bow down to the sun, then obviously the sun is better than the angels. Is that right? It's very, very obvious, very clear. Correct? All right. Hebrews 1 7. Indeed, when we speak of angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds and his servants fiery flames? Again, this is a quote. Whoever wrote this book, right? knew the Tanakh very well to rattle all of these off. This is a quote from Psalm 104.4 You make winds your messengers fiery flames your servants. He makes winds or spirits his messengers his angels, his servants a, a burning fire. What does that mean to you? Is this figurative or literal? Figured, if it's figurative, in what sense? What are the angels like? They're like wind or they're like fire. In what way? Maybe, maybe sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. They can move quickly. Uh, sp 
spirit. Um, that's what? Yeah, because the same word, of course, in Hebrew, spirit or wind. Mm -hmm. If it's in, if it's metaphorical, then it's saying these angels have qualities or attributes that are like wind or like fire. So, what would those be? That's what we're, some of those were about here, up here. Um, how about temporal? Does a fire burn forever? I don't know. It's tough to see with angels, right? Aren't they supposed to be? Mm. Well, it says spirit and fire it's and flame, so it's impressive because when you see a fire, it's like, so that's probably Represent judgment, maybe? Generally, don't fires don't last forever, but I mean, there will be one fire that lasts forever. Um, if it's not figurative, then how does this work? Does he send us messages via the creation itself? Does he send us messages by wind and by fire? In other words, um, doesn't God speak to us through nature, too? send us messages. The wind itself is a messenger. Fire itself could be a messenger. Anyway, this author was not the only one to make a statement about angels. This is a non-biblical book, but it's from that time period. It's a contemporary book for Ezra 8, 20 and 21 says, O Lord, before whom heaven's host stands trembling and at your word change to wind and fire. And in the Midrash, Yalkut Shimoni, an Agada compilation of the Bible, and the angel says to Samson's father, you remember the angel that visited Samson's parents before he was born? Yeah. The angel says to Samson's father, God changes us. Sometimes he makes us fire and sometimes wind. So you can see how uh, rabbinic under seemed to understand it as, you know, metaphorical. Uh, Or would you say that's literal, that he's actually changing the angel into wind or fire? It's kind of difficult to understand. You think it might be metaphorical, you think it might be literal, and then it's kind of like a mix in some thinking. Hebrews, moving on, Hebrews 1.8, but to the sun, because this is a comparison, he calls them wind or fire sometimes, or, or turns them into or whatever, but to the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You see, now we have a little, little context to tell us what he meant by the wind and the fire. But your son, you know, to him he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You rule your kingdom with a, a scepter of equity. That first word is important, but <laughs> to the sun. We have a comparison. Who's being compared? And what differences do you see in that comparison? Longevity. Forever and ever versus fire and wind. Right? What, what else? What other kind of comparison can you make between the angels? and the sun from that verse. Authority? From Look at the two different verses. Angels are just wind and fire. In verse 8, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You rule your kingdom. You see? Authority and role sitting on a throne has a position where they're just servants being sent out. Do you see? And he is sitting on a throne. Does it match messianic expectations in the Tanakh and elsewhere? That Messiah would be a king reigning. I think everybody would agree with that one. Did, can you think of a verse, though? Am I going too fast? <laughs> or am I too dry? Uh, the prophecy of um, Jacob over Judah 
The scepter will rise, right? The star will rise out of Jacob, and yeah, and then the scepter will not leave Judah until, right? Okay. How about this one? Look up Isaiah nine seven. Right? Isaiah nine seven. Someone read that for me. Diana, while they're looking that up, would you look up Luke one thirty three? So Isaiah 9, 7, whoever gets there first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now the context for that, if you don't remember, is... There will be to us a son will be born. To us a son will be born, right? And what is this? You know, we focus on some of those earlier things in certain circles. But what what else is this son going to be doing that's born to us? He's going to rule Israel, and for how long? And 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 his kingdom is just to expand and expand and never stop expanding, right? And he will reign forever. And Luke one thirty three, Diana. Does that sound familiar? It should sound familiar because guess what? It's a quote of Isaiah 9 7. <laughs> you see? All right. This author is very familiar with the Tanakh, and that's very clear. And that knowledge is not artificial in any way. This wasn't a novice making use of Google, <laughs> right? He didn't have any Google. He just had to know all this. They didn't have Google back then, or even Strong's Concordance, <laughs> right? Uh, or, or more uh, sophisticated tools, and there are many more, more sophisticated than Strong's Concordance as well. They didn't have those either. This person is just rattling off verses that illustrate the truths being shared without any of those more intricate tools that we have available to us. It makes sense that this person may well have been a student in Yerushalayim, you know, like Shaul. Paul. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness. This is God speaking to about the Son again still, right? Verse 9, where? Verse nine Hebrews 1, 9. You have loved, speaking about the Son, God speaking about the Son, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, O God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy and preference to your companions. Now we're learning something about this son. What does the text tell us about him? He loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Some people might suggest that that changed at some point. <laughs> but, but this is this is a letter from the Brich Hadashah. Yeshua hates wickedness and he loves righteousness where are now I have a question for you I want to interact with you tell me the answer where are righteousness and wickedness defined how do we know what's righteous and what's wicked where do we find that the Torah, the Torah. right mm-hmm. discuss when the present Western canon came about. All right, so um, who can? Does anyone in this room know when the books of the Bible, also known as the canon, when they were, when they became officially, when it became clo- a closed issue? 325? Nicaea, Council of Nicaea is a good guess. No? Seminary graduate? No. Huh? 
Okay. All right. Um, I can see the Tanakh, right? Um, some people call Old Testament, right? The Tanakh. All right. Uh, some say it was it was uh, solidified or whatever the Council of Jamnia or Yamnia, okay, in the first century. But really, it was just confirmed then. It actually uh, was solidified during the Hasmonean period. The Hasmoneans are the Maccabees. You remember the story of Hanukkah? The Maccabees were the, were the family that fought off the Syrian Greeks. They're the they find they're the ones who uh, solidified, you know, formed the Tanakh. So these are all the books. This is it. Okay. But the Brich Hadashah, or Messianic Scriptures, or whatever else you want to call them, the New Testament maybe, or something, uh, many writings were passed around and seen as authoritative in different cities, but it wasn't until the 5th century A.D. by a church council in Carthage when it was finally really solidified. Does this verse tell us whether or not God... In, in other words, why am I going there? Because if you want to say the scripture tells us what's righteous and not righteous, what was considered scripture when Hebrews was written? Do you see? Yeah, well, you could say Tanakh, and then what out of the Tanakh is where it tell, defines righteousness and wickedness? Because the prophets do also, you know, they, they're really repeating the same message. They're saying, you're screwing up. You're screwing up this. You're screwing up that. And where did this and that come from? The Torah. Yeah. Does this verse tell us whether or not God feels the same way about righteousness and wickedness that the Son does? Look at that Hebrews 1.9. Does that verse tell us how the Father, how God feels about righteousness and wickedness or only how the son feels about righteousness or wickedness? What do you think? I know I'm challenging you too much. It's Shabbat. You should be resting. <laughs> right? Resting in God and studying his word. <laughs> All right. Any idea? Okay, so it's clear that he's telling us how the son feels about righteousness and wickedness. But does it tell us how God feels that way? Does God feel the same way that the son does about righteousness and wickedness? And don't think outside. In this verse, does it tell us how the father feels? How do we know? How, does he t how do we know that? From this verse. Why? There's a key word there that you passed over, right? We hear about the son loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Then what does it say? What's the next word there? Therefore. Therefore, <laughs> therefore the father rewards him, right? So he must feel the same way about that, just, you know, that righteousness and you see what I'm saying? Why else would he reward him? I have a question about that. Um, do you mind if I ask a question? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your questions are pretty tricky. The Bible here says, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee. Why is he saying he is the shoe of God? I think we're getting to that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, what does Theos do here? What What does it mean that he anoints him? Some of you had a Hebrew class earlier. Um, the term Mashiach, okay, there's a difference between Hebrew and, and the Greek here. Mashiach is a Jewish king from the Davidic line who is expected to be anointed with holy anointing oil and rule Israel during the Messianic age. You with me? That's Mashiach. All of that stuff. Now there's a Greek word, Christos. 
<laughs> okay, which came to take on more meaning, but in this time frame, Christos could be used. It's a thing that has had oil rubbed on it. The thing could be a Messiah, but it could be a shield. <laughs> There was no Greek context for a Messiah, a, a Jewish king from the Davidic line who was expected to be... Da, 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 da. You understand? Translators had to find a word that they could grab onto and use. That's the best we could come up with. There was no Messiah, you know, whose father was who then? <laughs> Zeus? No, sorry. You understand? Christos, and then later on, you know, you get other words in English and German and whatever um, that are incorporated and their meaning changes over time, like Mazel Tov we've talked about and whatever. But originally, I mean, there's no word in another language that related really well to Mashiach. But Mashiach is someone who's anointed and much more than that. Now, where's the quote from in this verse? It's from Psalm 45, 7 and 8. Or in the Christian number system, 6 and 7. Okay? And you may say, what do you mean? It's come up already today. What do you mean? The Christian numbering system. <laughs> all right? So we're going all over with all kinds of neat stuff today. All right? Who can tell me without looking at the big screen? <laughs> Tell me the origin of the numbering system. When did the numbering system come into play? When did paragraph... You know, here's something else. In the, in the old time, the really... You didn't have paragraphs, breaks. You had nothing. In the Greek or the Hebrew, it used to just be letter, 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 letter. There's no, gra there's no periods or commas or co colons or anything. Just letter, 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 letter. And pack it in there, man, because the stuff you need to write on and write with are expensive. Figure it out, right? You think he would come past the stuff now? <laughs> yeah, try figuring that out. Do that with English, and it's, you know, not so tough, really. <laughs> not near as tough, but it is tougher than what you have to read normally. So, um, when did paragraphs come about? Any idea? I'm looking at you, seminary student. No? All right. The paragraphs were the first to come about. Paragraph divisions were of Hebrew origin during the Talmudic period from 135 to 500 AD. <laughs> there were no paragraphs before 135 AD. Somewhere between 135 and 500 AD, there were no paragraphs. The division of the text into verses was next in the same period, and but that was done by... Christians. The first numbering of verses was by Christians. Divisions into verses. And the chapter divisions were also done by Christians. 1330 AD. <laughs> so get the image out of your head that when Yeshua is being tempted in the wilderness, he said, well, it says in Leviticus 38, 14, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, you never see when they're quoting scripture they're, they're not giving chapter and verse because there weren't any those are artificially inserted they're useful they help us to find things sometimes uh, there's a lot of that's why there are two different systems here um, a theological bias can be <laughs> can be seen in how things are numbered and how things are divided too. So, um, and through language studies, we may run into that sometime and explain it better, but it exists. That sort of thing exists. Christian, the seminary student's not in Zen. He knows. All right. Good deal. Um, so, back to the quoted verse in Hebrews 1.9 that comes from Psalm 45, 7 and 8. Your throne, God, 
will last forever and ever. You rule your kingdom with a scepter of equity. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy in preference to your companions. I think this is where Devoro was wanting to go. Do you see there's... Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you? We already talked about God doesn't share his glory, God, because we have this English word God. It's very neat and concise. It's, you know, it's singular. <laughs> well, the Hebrew's not that way. I don't know. Hebrew students today, you saw Adonai. It's plural. You saw Elohim earlier on. It's plural. But it's used with singular verbs when it's talking about the God of Israel. But it's used with sing other singular nouns or pronouns when it's talking about the God of Israel. God is a uniplurality in the text, in the Hebrew text. Do you see? So how, can, so how can we say God doesn't share his glory with another? And then you have this text in the Psalms saying, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of... <laughs> Wait a minute, what's going on here? What's going on is this, this Elohim is a uniplurality. There's more than one person in this when you're saying Elohim. Do you understand? Now, when you pay attention uh, to those first three words, your throne, God. The Sansino Hebrew English edition of the Hebrew Bible. So, this is traditional. Hebrews translating into these that's the Sonsino Hebrew English Bible. Have you seen it? Okay. Their Bible, Psalm page uh, of the Psalms, page 140 has an interesting note on this verse. They acknowledge that this passage refers to King Messiah. That's admitted. It talks about this is King Messiah. But A. Cohen admits that the phrase, Thy throne, O God, thy throne, O God is the most obvious translation. Thy throne, God, will last forever and ever. He goes on to say that it doesn't suit the context. Why? A divine Messiah does not fit his theology. <laughs> That's why. Unfortunately for him, it's in the text. He modified his translation to say, Thy throne, given of God. <laughs> so let me show you the Hebrew and see if you can translate it for me. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of help. Um, kise means seat or throne. You know this, and you know this, and Torah knows this. The rest might not know that. But so, what do we have here? And you just went through this, so you should be able to get kisa ha. What is that ha ending being added to kise? You are. Is it plural, singular? Masculine, feminine? Singular. Singular. Masculine, singular. Your throne. Elohim. Which is, again, uniplural. Plural. So it's very clearly your throne, though, right? It's, it's not thy throne given of God. You see any other words in there? There's no other words there. talking about the Messiah and it's saying thy throne O God you see do you see the significance if you're talking to a Jewish person yeah. again this is a passage about the messianic king the most the most handsome of men it says in verse 3 is it is a king who will reign for eternity that reigning for eternity part is important it should remind you of Isaiah 9, where a child is born to rule over the kingdom of David, we read it, forever. And we will see that point made again later. Hebrews 1.10. Look at we're flying this time. 
took us weeks to get five verses. Now, okay, Hebrews 1.10. And in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. Heaven is the work of your hands. It's another quote. I just can't get away from quoting here. Another quote from Psalm 102, 26 to 28, or 25 to 27 in the Christian numbering system. Again, Psalm 102, 26 to 28. Or back those up by one in the Christian numbering system, 25 to 27. And if you look, especially at the LXX, that Septuagint, that oldest version that we have available to us, you find that this is spoken by God and addressed to yud he vav <laughs> The name, Hashem, spoken by Elohim to yud he vav It's the beginning of God's response to the one pleading for aid in this Messianic psalm. Check it out together if you have time. You know, later on at home or a Bible study this week or something. Uh, the Psalm 102, 26 to 28. The Psalm is, uh, it's a Messianic Psalm. This, this, there's like an individual who's suffering, and they're, I think this is the one where they're, they're betting on his, or gambling over his stuff. I can't remember for sure if this is that one. Maybe we can check it out. And by the time you get here, now you have an answer coming. And it's very clear in the Septuagint that, that what's happening is uh, this answer is from God to yud heh vav -Heh. Okay? And God says to the one suffering, here's, here's the uh, complete Jewish Bible. In the beginning, you sufferer, you laid the foundations of the earth. Heaven is the work of your hands. They, these people persecuting you, they will vanish, but you will remain. Like clothing, they will all grow old. Yes, you will change them like clothing. They will pass away. Now we're talking about the heavens and the earth. Right? But you remain the same and your years never end. God encouraged Yeshua when he was being persecuted by pointing at his future. The author of Hebrews will do the same thing for his audience, the Jewish people who are being persecuted. Point us at the future. The same thing is good for you when you're being persecuted now. Think about your future. Right? This life is, what was our verse from the Haftarah? Your life here, all of our lives here, even if you live to a hundred, are extremely short when compared to eternity. If you're undergoing something that's tough, hang in there! Like, if you could, if you could wrap up all of Hebrews... You know, and it's tough for me to I'll ramble for a year. But if you could wrap it all up in like three words, that's it. Hang it. Wait a minute, two words. Hang on. <laughs> Even better. Okay. 111. They will vanish, but you, but you will remain like clothing. They will all grow old. Who are the they that will grow old and vanish? Devorah? You just read a lot about that. <laughs> right? What is it? In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth. Heaven is the work of your hands. They will vanish, but you will remain. There's one sense that he could be talking about those people that are persecuting. Another sense, he could be talking about creation itself. And a lot of people say that's the one, right? That it will vanish, right? That creation will, will vanish. Um, so what do you think about that? The vanishing. Is creation going to go away? Will creation just be gone forever and have a brand new creation in its place? Think about the new moon. Remember we talked about the new moon? Okay, you have to, the context for this one is verse 11. They, uh, no, no, verse 12. They will vanish, but you will remain like clothing. They will grow old. And verse 12 tells us what? And you will fold them up like a coat. They will be changed. 
like clothing, but you will remain the same. Your years will not, your years will never, they're not being burned up and thrown away or something. They're going to be changed, right? There's a great book about, do you remember the name? Is it he, uh, Heavens and Earth? I can't remember that I learned through. That's why I'm going through this with it. You don't remember? All right. If you're interested, text me. <laughs> and I'll get you the name of the book. Because there are scriptures that seem to say that the heavens and the earth will just be completely destroyed in a new one. And there are other verses that say like the earth stands forever. Like ever, ever. And so what's really the story, what's going on here? A lot of it has to do with context, right? Yeah. And he covers it very thoroughly. What's, you know, it's going to be transformed. When something's going to be destroyed, we're, it's, all, it's talking about the world system, right? And it needs to be, <laughs> that world system today needs to be destroyed. Yeah. But the planet is going to you know, when Yeshua returns, what, where does he go? He come, brings a new Jerusalem with him. He comes down to Jerusalem. I mean, down to Israel with that new Jerusalem. And he reigns here. And we reign with him. We are with him. That's what the text says. Some of you don't like that. <laughs> I wanted to get a harp and sit on the cloud, or I wanted my own planet. Some people say you get your own planet or something. <laughs> well, there's no more tear, no more suffering, no more pain, no good. Yeah, that's right. This will be a different, a transformed, a changed place. It would be like paradise restored, but even better. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the time? Hey, it's time to go. Um, all right, so they will be changed. Ah, they will be changed. They will be renewed or restored in the context of all Scripture. The old world system will be destroyed, but the planet will remain. In fact, Yeshua is returning with a new Jerusalem to rule and reign from his throne over the whole earth, and we will be with him. Verse 13, moreover... Hebrews 1.13, Moreover, to which of the angels has he ever said, oh, another quote? Oh, the guys, <laughs> right? How much, how much stuff can he quote here about this topic? To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Guess what? Psalm 110.1. We covered this one already in an earlier message on Hebrews. It's interesting that it's coming up again already in the same chapter. He's bringing the same verse up again. So it must be pretty important, don't you think? I would watch the other video if I were you to see what you missed. But in short, this is a messianic passage and uh, where the Hebrew yud heh vav -Hey speaks to someone, King David, who King David calls his master, Adonai. Do you remember that? And this is very strange since the Messiah is a descendant or a son of David. It's not normal in that culture for a father to call, as a matter of fact, it never happens, a father to call his son his master. But in this verse, the, the, the Messiah, you know, yud heh -Hey is speaking to someone that King David calls his master, Adonai. And, and the Messiah is a descendant of David. If you understand the culture, that never happens. So how can the Messiah be David's master? This might sound familiar because Yeshua makes this point when he confronts religious leaders in Jerusalem. First he asks them, whose son is the Messiah? Right? Do you remember? And the answer is David's. And he says, then how is Psalm 1101? No, because it would no numbers for chapters and verses. But the words that are there, he confronts them with. Then how could David call him his master? That's why it's a problem. That's why they couldn't come up with an answer for him. And it's very, you know, it's very profound. And no one asked him any questions after that. That's why. 114, aren't they all merely spirits who serve, sent out, talking about the angels, sent out to help those whom God will deliver? Angels are powerful. We've talked about that. 
really powerful. It's not like touched by an angel. <laughs> when they reveal themselves, you fall on your face, terrified, and you have no energy, you can't get up, you need help. It's not just a little glow on the back of your head or something. Now they can disguise themselves, you don't know that they're angels, and you know, a different story. But when they reveal themselves, they are awesome. They are awesome. And yet, they serve. Who do they serve in this verse? Who does it say that the angels serve? Those whom God will deliver. Those whom God will deliver, they serve those whom God will deliver. What's the point? What's the point? Hebrews 2.1 Therefore, all these quotes, all these verses, why, what's the big, okay, he's greater than angels, okay, he's greater than prophets, okay, we have a greater message, what's the point? Therefore, we must pay much more careful heed to the things we have heard, so that we will not drift away. When you understand who Yeshua is, when you understand the message, then you need to understand how much more important it is and pay that much more attention to it. And we're going to go into that in future weeks more. But this is like a warning. Therefore, because he's so much greater, pay more attention so that, why do you need to pay more attention? So that you don't drift away. The author's first point is made very, very clear through a whole chapter. And he makes that point with the word, therefore. Right? Again, a people under persecution would be more prone to falling away, if not encouraged. And that is this author's intention, to, to encourage his audience by reminding them whose message it is that they put their faith in. Maybe you've been struggling as well. Maybe you're not being persecuted but maybe you are there might be people who are watching us on our different venues who are persecuted maybe you're persecuted in lesser ways mocked by family or people at work or kids at work even who knows Whatever you're going through, I want to encourage you with those same words that I used to sum up the whole book of Hebrews. Hold on. You haven't put your trust in a false promise, a false prophet, or a false idea. It's not a, you're not putting your faith in something that's lesser than what traditional Judaism offers. It's better. It's way better. You're like the homeless man who found a priceless gem in an open field. You don't just leave it there. <laughs> Take it. Hold on to it. Show yourself faithful to the very end and you will be rewarded beyond what you could possibly imagine. Again, this life is short. You can do this. Hold on to your faith. And remember that faith is not just mental assent when I say that. It's something you live out. If you really believe something, then you act on it. Right? Right? <laughs> okay. Father, the dark tide is rising again in our time. So we ask that you would intervene to save us. Come against this evil, rising evil, like a glorious flood. Rescue us and empower us to serve you and bring honor and glory to your name, Vashem Yeshua. Amen.
See? The finished chapter what? <laughs> Was that too dense, though? I was like, man, I bet some of them are kind of tired of Hebrews chapter 1, so... But it's better to go slow and think like that because when you just grab... I was just talking about, we studied this, the book of Hebrews, we studied mm -hmm. it's a little different perspective. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. Because... Just... <laughs> But look, what you're getting, don't think of it as just studying Hebrews. When you're studying Hebrews, you need the, the, that culture and the, and the context from history and language and lit, all those aspects that fit in there. Those are all magnificent things that you're learning along with it. Do you know what I mean? How do we know what he was talking, that he was, that their understanding of righteousness came from this or that? Well, what was scripture at the time? How do we know what was scripture at this time? We've got to know history. How do we know when he's talking about the radiance of, of, of the Father? You know, that, that phrase. That, that, how do we, what is it talking about? Most people just gloss over it. What's it talking about? It's talking about the Shekinah. The pres divine presence of God among men. Most people don't even stop to pause there. And they don't know what it means. They just keep going. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, I'm done. I'm still... Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of That's stuff in there that you need to understand to grasp the scripture properly. You need to know what the idioms mean. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or you might think, you know, it's... I stopped the recording in case somebody's watching there. Yeah, you might think it's evil to celebrate your birthday or something. <laughs> there's an idiom in Job talks about... Uh, his day. Each each one of the sons and the daughter. When it came, each one of the sons. It was only the sons, because they would invite the daughters. Each one, when it came to his day, they would invite the rest of the of the family over to their house, including um, including the sisters. And these celebrations each went on for multiple days. And when those days were over, Yov or Job would do make sacrifices for them, just in case they might have sinned. In other words. The, the celebration itself was not a sin. It's just in case they got carried away and sinned while they were celebrating. They might need a sacrifice. Do you follow? And each one had have, have the celebration on his day. Now, you know, his day could mean a lot of things. But you go later on in the same book, which is important. Because different people use different phrases the same, and different and idioms change over time and stuff. So you go a few chapters back in the same book, which is, by the way, the, some most people say the oldest book in the Bible. Um, that's not saying it's older than what. See, Moses came after Abraham, right? And Moses wrote the Torah. He really compiled the Torah from records that were there. But we don't have those. We have what Moses, what Moses did. So now Job is from Abraham's time. Did you know that? So it's really the oldest book we actually have. And so words and phrases are different and idioms and stuff are different. So when it's talking about his day, now we have to go in that same oldest book of the Bible that we have. Look, I think it's chapter 3. It talks about when Job is going through all this stuff and he says, uh, he makes this about his day. He's, he talks about, I, I wish, you know, my day, it's phrased in a way that it comes out his day. You know, um, that it had never come about. I curse, I'm like cursing his day. He's talking about his birthday. It's very clear from the next verse. He's talking about his birthday. The day of his birth is his birthday. So if you, <laughs> so whatever, man. Look, I'm not, there's nothing, I'm not making a case that, hey, you must celebrate birthdays. That's not what I'm doing. But don't let somebody come and tell you that it's evil or something to be happy and celebrate, like go to eat or something. You know, now there's, it, a lot of it depends on what you're going to do on your birthday. That could be a different story. <laughs> and how you celebrate could be a different story. There's nothing wrong with celebrating your birthday. You with me? If you're going to get, you know, rip roaring drunk and get in an accident or do something stupid with, you know, sex outside of marriage or something or any number, a lot of different things that could happen when you lose control because of or whatever yeah those are that's a different story but just celebrating your birthday is not a problem well, there's a, a no one's getting up I'll just keep going then there's a, a, <laughs> right away like, oh that's what they church my legs. there's also a, um, a church that they don't I don't know if it's Seventh-day Adventist actually yeah. that because of uh, 
the guy when they chopped off John the Baptist's head, it was for the birthday. It or happened something. to be Herod's birthday. And, and there's birthday. also the episode, and, and the, what they don't want to tell you too, there's the episode, uh, you know, where Joseph is freed. It's Pharaoh's birthday, and it's an awful day because it's a birthday again. It's an awful day. You know why it's awful? Because one of those two guys that was in prison with Joseph was executed. They don't want to focus on the other side. There was another guy in prison with him who was rescued and restored to his position. And they don't want to store that they certainly don't want to want to emphasize or focus on the part about Joseph, the, the you know, the guy that the story's about. What happened to him on Pharaoh's birthday? <laughs> right? He came out of jail on the Pharaoh's birthday and became the second highest person in the country. Don't want to go there. You know, and, they, and when they talk about uh, Yeshua, if you remember right, when Yeshua is born, what happens then? On his birthday, his day, the day of his birth. Angels come down, myriads of angels come down, and they go to the shepherds and they tell them the good news, and the shepherds go on rejoicing on his birthday to see him. And as they're doing that, the angels burst forth in song singing and praising God because it's Yeshua's birthday. They don't want to talk about that. But if they do talk about it, well, that's not his birthday. That's just the day he was born. What? <laughs> 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 not sure. Maybe I need to look up birthday again. But I'm pretty sure it's his birthday when he was born. But... <laughs> no, there was, it's true there's not, not a Jewish... At the time, there's not a, there was not a, it was not common for Jews to celebrate birthdays, you know, on a regular basis or something. Okay, fine. So, doesn't mean it's evil or something. You see what I mean? No, that's not. Yeah, I stopped a lot. Okay, now we're ready for the announcement. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 
Shabbos is Shabbos. It was always good Shabbos. Yeah. Right. Well, 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 Okay. <laughs> Did you say so? <laughs> and you know, you know why? Because people mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Matters to some. E M O R A. Yeah. 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 Thank sure. you. 